Now, as you look at these eight, eight Beatitudes, they all build one upon another. And this is what the Christian life looks like as you begin to move through it. The first thing is we've got to learn that we are poor in spirit, that we are bankrupt, that we are bankrupt spiritually, that apart from God coming in and we admitting our poverty to stand before him and to have anything in ourselves to offer, that that's the beginning doorway. That's where it all starts. And when you enter that doorway, you start to mourn over the things that break God's heart, and especially in your life. You get very sensitive about sin. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are gentle or meek, literally power under control. You surrender your life to God. If you have a genuine walk with God beginning, you not only realize your poverty, you're mourning over the sins of your life, but you start to just surrender everything to God. And then you have a hunger and you have a thirst for righteousness. You're hungry for, for God's righteousness in your life. It, a hunger and a thirst for the righteousness. Know, our righteousness is filthy rags. So we're not trying to impress the world to be more religious. We want to tell the world that the only hope we have is because we have the righteousness of God. And then tonight or this morning... We're going to look at the next four. When we are truly born again like this, and we realize that we have been forgiven to such a great level, we want to show that same kind of mercy to the rest of the world. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And then we, we want the will of God to be the number one thing. And we're going to look at this. Blessed are the pure in heart who have an unmixed heart. For they shall see God. Why aren't we seeing God? Because the world's distracting us. Our heart's not pure. It's mixed. And then we come to uh, number seven, that we want to be ambassadors. We want to go out and we want to make God's peace presented to the world. We want to be peacemakers. And when we are peacemakers, then we are like God's son. Jesus Christ, what he came to do. Now, if you add all these things up and all these seven things are true of you, what we're going to look at this morning is how is the world going to treat someone like that? If you just don't do any of those things and say you're a Christian, the world's no problem. We're good. But if you are all these things, then number eight is going to come into play in a big way. All who desire to live godly, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. You know, it's a life worth living. A life worth living. I was thinking this week, why do women like flowers so much? We just got through Mother's Day. Why do women like flowers? The easiest way to waste your money, honey, is to buy me flowers. I say, what am I going to do with these? They're going to die. Within the week, they'll be dead. Why would I want these flowers? Well, you know, i got to figure it out. I can imagine Adam in the Garden of Eden. Just imagine the flowers in the Garden of Eden. They must have been beautiful everywhere. And he's probably, some, one day, he's sitting there, he's probably thinking, you know, my rib just, they just don't feel right today. And he's got a bunch of flowers, and he says, you know, these are really pretty. These are really nice. He's looking at them, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Eve. And he's like, no. That is pretty. That is what looks good. So as men, we've got beauty all around us. But what was Eve's reaction? She probably walks over, looks at him, looks at the flowers, picks them up, says, no, these are really pretty. <laughs> I mean, we just, if women don't love flowers, they don't got a lot of beauty to look at in the world. If it's all about us, and poor Adam, what's he going to do? He's probably, I thought Adam's probably thinking, you know what? Baby, I own this garden. And then now she says, okay, I like you. <laughs> but the life, Adam could have stuck with the flowers. But God brought him something so much more beautiful. And there are a lot of people that are carrying around the things of this world, the dead flowers, passing away. 
when God is offering them a life that is forever, that is much more beautiful, that God has fashioned and created just for us. And Jesus says, you want to follow me? This is how you do it. This is where it starts. This is where it goes. And I'm not, I'm not going to hide from you where it's going to ultimately lead to and the world's going to react against you. This is a road of friction. And the world's going to react against this, this uh, direction you go. So this is mountaintop living. This is a life that is different. And we are called to be different from, from the world. And the more of these things are true in your life, the more elevation you're going to have, the higher you're going to be living. And, you know, the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Well, reverse that a little bit. My ways are not God's ways. I've got my ways. And that is what discipleship, that is what growing in our, in our, in our sanctification is all about. It is learning that our ways, what we think is right, is probably going to be very different from what God ultimately wants for our life. And a lot of our prayers are trying to make our ways God's ways. And we need to make God's ways our ways. That's what prayer should be all about. So here you got four additional things that are part of this pathway to where God wants to take our life. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are those who treat others as God has treated them, as God has treated us. Now, when this was spoken when jesus said this in this roman empire especially that israel was under mercy was was a vice but not a virtue it was not a positive thing at all it was a sign of weakness just like it is in a lot of the middle middle eastern cultures today they look down on mercy power strength that's what what it's supposed to be all about one roman philosopher wrote that mercy is a disease of the soul and here Jesus says, blessed or happy are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, Shakespeare, you didn't see me this coming. In The Merchant of Venice, this is what he wrote in his play. He said, mercy always comes down. It starts with God, moves to man. It begins in heaven and ends on earth. You don't bargain for mercy because to make a bargain, you've got to have something to offer. And we have nothing to offer God. That's what mercy is. Mercy is, is receiving, not receiving what we do deserve. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve, but mercy is not receiving. For our sins, for our guilt, for, our, for the punishment we deserve, not receiving that because that was placed upon Christ by God's mercy. And if you sit down, if I sat down and thought of all the idiotic, stupid things that I have on my record before God, there's not enough paper to write them all down. And yet God has shown me that kind of mercy. You know, 70 times 7, that's not enough. I mean, maybe that's enough between humans, but not between myself and God in, in a day. And yet God has shown me mercy. I am responsible to be so impacted by that that I show that same mercy to others around me. Because nobody's going to to sin against me more than I sin against God. And yet God chose to show me mercy. You know, there's a parable that Jesus told about the man who had this debt, bigger than probably our national debt, and yet he was forgiven that debt, and then he went out, and he found somebody who owed him much, much less, and he demanded payment from him. And he was condemned for that. When we forget how much we have been forgiven of and we go out and we treat others with with a lack of mercy because they maybe they have done something or owe us something and we are not showing ourselves to be like god and what god has done for us it says that they shall receive mercy you know god has has something for us when we show mercy to others he shows mercy even more so to us and you know david did that david had two opportunities to take saul out and if you just spun it the right way, you would say that, well, God delivered him right into this cave. God delivered me right up to where there he's lying there asleep. All I 
got to do is pick up the spear. The spear's waiting right for me. Yet David showed mercy. And mercy became something that God showed David in his own life. With Bathsheba, God, as bad as that was, as bad as it played out, God's mercy was the end story. Uh, with Absalom, with the plague, God showed mercy to David in spite of his, his uh, wrongdoings. But David had shown mercy earlier, and David showed mercy later with Mephibosheth. A man after God's own heart. And one of the indicators is that he was a man of mercy, even though he made a lot of mistakes. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those whose heart is like Christ, single-minded, the will of God is where our focus is. You know, I heard something disturbing this week about the top 10 evangelical books of 2019. This is probably going to get me in trouble after the Garden of Eden thing got me some points. Eight of the ten are written by women. Used to be almost all men. Men aren't writing books. And that women wrote them is not a bad thing in itself, but these women are pro-lesbian. There's one of them out there, girl, get your face on or something. That's one of our number one evangelical books. Whatever happened to C.S. Lewis, A.W. Tozer, what happened to people like that? MacArthur, Swindoll, James Kennedy, Francis Schaeffer, the idiocracy of the church. We've lost a purity of heart in the body of Christ. And again, it's a single focus. It's Without mixture, you, you, painting the pump doesn't purify the water. You know, how, no matter how impressive we may try to present ourselves, that doesn't mean there's purity in the church. They shall see God. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Jeremiah 17 says the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Romans 7 Paul said, the things which I do, I don't want to do. The things which I want to do, I don't do. I got a heart problem. Wretched man that I am. David in Psalms 32 said, created me a clean heart. God, I want a clean heart. That's my prayer. Did you pray for that today? God, I live in a land of, of impure lips, as Isaiah said. A people of impure lips. God, I need a clean heart. How do you get a clean heart? Well, purity, the word purity, we get our word catheter from that. And a catheter is something that cleanses, removes impurities from the, from the body. So a pure heart is one is the contamination of sin. All those things that would, would uh, try to compete for our affection for God are harmful elements and need to be removed on a daily basis. You know, back in, in my day, Ivory Soap advertised as being 99 and 44, 100% pure. Even that's not pure. Only 100%. And the only, <laughs> the only way we can reach 100% is the righteousness of Christ. How do we purify ourselves? Well, the Bible says there are two elements that are, are used fire and water fire speaks of the trials of life that god uses job 23 10 says he knows the way that i take when he has tried me i shall come forth as gold so so god sends fire not to destroy us but to purify us that's what trials come into our life under the permission of god for and job knew that because satan had actually asked permission god had invited him sent him an invitation but God's purpose in it was for him to become brought forth as gold and develop greater character, godly character. Water is a symbol for the word of God. John 15, 3 says, Jesus said to his disciples, you are already clean because of the word that I have 
spoken to you. Paul said in Ephesians 5, God makes his church holy by the washing with water through the word. Water can make us clean. You can fill up a bathtub and you can go in there and you can stare for 30 minutes. You won't get any cleaner unless you get in. You got to have the word of God washing. Can't just look at it, have a Bible on your shelf somewhere. You got to open it. You got to use it to cleanse. It says that they shall see God. They shall see God. A pure heart. It's all about the heart to see God. It's not about the intellect. There are a lot of atheists out there. They can intellectually try all day long to see God, and somebody with a heart of purity and faith is totally in, on the pulse of God. They shall see God. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You know, blessed are those who, who reach beyond themselves into the other people's lives because of what God has done for them. President Eisenhower said, we become a race of intellectual giants and moral pygmy, pygmies. Despite our great technological advances, we continue to devise more efficient means of killing each other. You know, we're not very good at being peacemakers. That's why the Prince of Peace needed to come into the, to the world. The Bible says in Romans 12, we're to live peaceably with all men as much as it is possible. Some people are just hard to live with, like Hitler. But as much as is possible, we are to live peaceable with all men, and we are to present the only, you know, man is, and we are looking at a time in history, probably more rumors of wars than you can imagine of any other time. Man just doesn't, do, man reloads whenever we think we got peace. The only peace is going to come from a relationship with God, internally peace, but also when God transforms a culture. That's the only time that peace is even possible. So peacemakers are those whose opposite would be causing dissension and being bent towards strife and, and conflict. Peace takers, like we are, should become peacemakers. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He offers us the only peace that is the avenue of peace because the world doesn't have a real avenue of genuine peace. Remember Andy Rooney, Rooney on 60 Minutes? He uh, was think, recalling his education at Colgate in the years just before World War II. One of his philosophy teachers always said this because World War II was in danger of happening. Any peace is better than any war. And Rooney, as a college student, he listened to that, and he kind of, yeah, that's true, until he went and saw the World War II Holocaust camps. And he realized some things are worth fighting for. And some things are worth fighting against. And as soon as you forget that, you become a victim rather than a conqueror when you forget what's worth fighting for because Satan is never going to let up. Sometimes you have to disturb the peace to distribute peace because we live in a world a war zone. Spiritually, that's what we've been born into. Sinful mankind is at war with God's holiness and needs peacemakers standing in the gap. And that's what we are to be, to offer that hope of reconciliation. It says that we shall be the sons of God. And Jesus came and it says he came to seek and to save the lost. Now, if all these things are true, how does the world treat a person like this? And that's the last one. Blessed are those who get, guess what's coming to them. If this is who you are, expect it. It's coming. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice be glad it says in Luke leap for joy 
For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, Jesus said in, in John, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Be happy about it. When you see tribulation, you see persecution on the horizon like an Oklahoma tornado headed your way, be happy. You got a storm shell cellar. It's called Jesus. He's overcome it. Rejoice because you have just moved into a better neighborhood, the land of the prophets who were persecuted before you. You're moving on up, George Jefferson. <laughs> With Isaiah, Jeremiah. It says when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know, when we are persecuted for standing up for the only hope of the world being redemption through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Because our righteousness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. Paul said he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the message we have to share with the world. That the only way is the way of Christ. That's the message the world hates. So when we are persecuted for righteousness sake, it's because we have stood strong on the cross, on the blood of Christ, upon the gospel, upon the fact that all of us, are born sinners. We all have a sin problem. We all need to be redeemed and rescued, ransomed. That's what the world doesn't like like to hear. In Luke 6, where the, uh, the Sermon on the Plain is in Luke 6, and it's got some similar things, but Jesus adds to things that he says that are similar to this. He says, he had some woes. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. He kind of reverses it. Not when they're speaking bad and insulting and persecuting and, and make up things about you. But if they're speaking well of you, woe unto you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. The world's got some good words for somebody who may be out in, in a church somewhere. That was happening a long time ago. They were saying that to the false prophets. So we live in, a, in the midst of a... This easygoing, popular, religious, acceptable to the world stuff where there's no conviction, no cross. If you go along, you get along. It's kind of the rule that's out there, and the world loves its own. And the key to a crowd is just do what the world says. John 15, Jesus said, If you belong to the world, you would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now, in America, we're, pro we're probably pretty okay with when he's blessed are they that are persecuted. But then he changes the language from the they to the you. When you are insulted, when you are persecuted, when you are treated badly, all of a sudden, Jesus is looking them in the eye and saying, okay, I've said all these wonderful things, now I'm talking to you guys. This is not generalities anymore. Disciples, you guys following me? This is what's going to happen to you in your life. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised by fiery trials. That word surprise, it's like don't be startled by a stranger that comes in your midst. Which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange strangers visit same word strange thing were happening to you don't be confused if it's not happening be concerned if it's not happening don't be startled if it is this is a visit you should expect i had a, a church member in hannibal years ago he uh his name was James Hefley. And he came up and he brought me a book. I said, I've already got that book. Oh, okay, well, I wrote in it because I wrote this book. It was a book called By Their Blood. And it is an addendum to Fox's Book of Martyrs about 
all of the persecution that happened since Fox's Book of Martyrs you know, ended off, he kind of filled in some gaps, and he's, he's passed away now. There's a lot more gaps to be filled in because the 20th century has more than all the others combined. 21st century has more than all the others combined. Christians are being persecuted all around the world. And this is consistent with what happened. You know, Jesus spoke this to the disciples. Every one of them was persecuted. It was prophetic. James was beheaded by King Herod, Herod Agrippa, 44 AD. Philip was crucified, modern day Turkey, 54 AD. Matthew was killed with a combination of a spear and a battle axe in Ethiopia in 60 AD. James the Less was stoned and bludgeoned by the Jews. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Macedonia, modern day Greece. <clears throat> Peter was crucified upside down in Rome in 64 AD. Judas, not Iscariot, was crucified in Macedonia in 72. Uh, Nathaniel was flayed alive and crucified in Armenia or India. Thomas was impaled with a spear in India. Simon, not Peter, was crucified in Britain, it says, in 74 AD. And John was boiled in oil in 81 AD. The Bible says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul told the Philippian church from his jail cell, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. You know, realize, when it comes to persecution, realize five things. Number one, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be persecuted for Jesus' sake. That's what the Bible says. Number two, it's evidence that we're living. We're living like he lived. Number three is fellowship. Philippians, it says, the fellowship of his sufferings. There is a level of fellowship with Christ that you don't reach apart from sharing in his sufferings. Number four is opportunity. It's opportunity for a witness. And number five is growth. It's where we grow. It's how we grow. Adrian Rogers said, joy is the thermostat of your life. Joy is the thermostat. Persecution is a thermometer which measures your life. You seem to set your joy up every day. That's the thermostat of persecution. It's measuring where your life is. First Peter 4, it says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and, the God, and of God rests on you. Romans 8 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The word persecution itself, we get our, one of our words we get from it is pursue. When we're persecuted with the biblical meaning of the word, we are pursued. We don't have to, the world will find us when we live this kind of life. And it's hard to imagine that the world would pursue somebody who is humble, who is mourning over things that shouldn't be in their life, who is gentle or meek, you know, somebody who is uh, merciful, somebody who's trying to make peace. That's exactly what the world does. It says the world, you know, the world will welcome a compromising Christian, but it hates one that does the will of God. You know, Jesus, when he spoke to his disciples, Jesus didn't promise to be with you at the end of a pew. He promised to be with you at the end of the world. And we come in here and we say, oh, Jesus, come on in, come on in, come open the doors. You know, Jesus, we need to get him in here as quick as we can. Jesus is out in the world saying, come on. Go into all the world and I will be with you. And we say, go into the church once a week. He'll be with us. The Bible says that we are to storm the gates of hell. We are to tread upon scorpions. 
When you read stuff like that, the world should be afraid of us. The world should be sitting there going, it's almost 12 o'clock. They're about to let them out. Get ready. But is the world worried about the church? The church is more worried about the world. How to look like it. Colossians 1.24 says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What Jesus did was the beginning of what his body would fully receive. And Paul said, what I have received is my part in filling up the totality of the afflictions of the body of Christ. In southern India, there's a school there trains preachers, whenever they go through the, the graduation ceremonies, they get their cap, they get their gown, they get their certificate, but they also get a shovel. They get a shovel. And when this particular guy who was, who was visiting asked uh, the higher-ups why they hand out shovels, and they, they tell these young people that when you arrive at a place to preach, start digging a hole. And when they ask you why you're doing it, tell them, this is where you'll place my body after you kill me. Another Indian pastor said that whenever they, and I heard him this week say this, with all the persecution and everything that's going on with the Hindus attacking many in the church now, he said they, they asked about how we could pray for them. He said, don't pray for the persecution, that the persecution will stop. That's part of the Christian life. We pray that God will open doors so that we can be salt and light. That we can be salt and light. You know, this is the life that we are given one shot through. How are we going to do it? What are the choices? You know, Jesus has given us a road map. You know, last, you know, when I was a kid, we would come down, lived, grew up in Oklahoma, we'd come down to Texas to visit my grandparents because my bloodline's Texan, all right? So that's where we all came from. My dad uh, crossed the border of the Red River and went up to Oklahoma, and I finally got back here. But we would come back, Denton, Texas. I remember going to my grandparents and, them mentioning that, oh, the girl across the street, she just won Miss America. They lived right across the street from Phyllis George and her family in Denton, Texas. Well, Phyllis George died this Thursday. She passed away up in Kentucky. 70 years old. A lot of Great life, a lot of memory, Christian testimony, as, as I remember. But you know, we've got another 70-ish person that's leaving this world. Robbie Zacharias is at the end of his life. There's no more treatment that can be done for him. And he's been tweeting out different things that scripturally, and one of the things that he tweeted out this week, he was ready. I hope Phyllis was ready for death. But Ravi is definitely, Ravi is definitely ready. But he, he tweeted out out of 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The earth is passing away, we're passing away. This vessel, is, it's got an expiration date on it. I can't find it, I wish I could, but it's there. It's going to happen. But there's a treasure that was put in this vessel for me in 1979. I've got to choose the path I'm going to take with that treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. God's given us the potential for everything we do to be of him and not us because of that treasure. Now, because of taking that path, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, 
but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus Christ, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. The world needs to see Jesus in me, and the way that happens is I am afflicted, perplexed, per persecuted, and struck down. But I react right by the power that God has in me. And then this is what Ravi put in. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You know, this pathway, it, it's about the inner man. The outer man, you know, I wish I could run like I, I did at age 20. Wish I could, you know, do the sports like I did at age 20. But I don't want to be stupid like I was at age 20. <laughs> the inner man's been doing good. The outer man, not so good. But that's okay. It's, it's an earthen vessel. It's going to pass away. And I want to pass away like Ravi when that day comes. But you know what? When it comes to your faith, you are either a secret agent or a sacred agent. Your, your faith and how you live it is either top secret or top sacred. It's at the top of your life. It's either hidden or hollered, shushed or shared, a priority or it's private. I mean, you can be like Adam. Hang on to the flowers, Adam. That way, lady. Or you can throw the flowers, throw the world's things down and embrace what God wants for you. He's crafted, he's prepared a wonderful life for us. And Jesus said, this is it. This is how you get there. But it's going to run end to a pretty rough road. That's all right, because that rough road gives you a greater resurrection. It's worth the trip. And when you get to your destination, it will be pale in comparison to anything that you've suffered. Would you bow?